Well, greetings, church family. Today's daily Bible reading had us in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. We see Zacchaeus' faith and repentance. That wee little man, Zacchaeus, he was a chief tax collector. Uh, that means even higher than Matthew when, when old Levi was still uh, acting in the role of a tax collector and Jesus called him to follow him. Luke actually expressly calls the short man here, Zacchaeus, rich. But what do we see? We see a trust in Jesus by this great sinner. A trust that led him to climb a tree just to see Christ passing through Jericho. As a rich man, he certainly could have afforded to put himself at the front of the crowd. He just wanted to see Jesus pass by. And note that when Jesus calls up to him as he's in that sycamore tree, Zacchaeus receives Christ gladly. He willingly takes Jesus and his disciples in for dinner. And note also, Zacchaeus must have genuinely believed in Christ. We see three lines of evidence here. First, we see his recognition of his sin, defrauding others. We see his willing repentance, not just recognition of his sin, by the way, but confession of it. Then his willing repentance, giving half his possession to the poor, going above and beyond and restituting money that he took illicitly. Very different from the rich young ruler who was so self-righteous, said, ah, I've done everything in the law since I was young. And by the way, I don't want to give my possessions to the poor. Zacchaeus confesses his sin, wants to give away his earthly treasures to others and we see Christ's confirmation. Salvation had come to Zacchaeus' house. In verses 11 through 27, we see the parable of the minas. This is very similar to the parable of the talents from Matthew 25. There are some major differences. It shows us that this was a completely different parable from Christ, but with a very similar point about the importance of being faithful to the Lord. So instead of three slaves, here there are ten. Unlike the talents in, in Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, here we see that the slaves are given minas. A talent was about 15 years worth wages. A mina was about 100 days worth of wages. And instead of different amounts being given to the slaves, here each slave is given one mina. And this parable specifies the rewards given to the faithful slaves, while the parable of the talents left that rather vague. Here we see the reward for faithfulness in this parable was authority over as many cities as the amount of minas returned to the master after faithfully using the one that he had entrusted them with. Now in the first century AD, a slave failing to faithfully use the resources his master entrusted him with, as well as subjects actively revolting against the ruler, verse 14, results in swift and terrible judgment. And so Jesus brings this up in the parable because... Everybody would be expecting this to happen as the result, but also to emphasize how serious the Lord takes matters when we refuse to submit to our King, Jesus. Speaking of Jesus as King, verses 28 through 38 is his humble entry as King into Jerusalem. Note that in verse 31, Jesus does refer to himself as the Lord, the Master, when giving his disciples the instruction to go and find this donkey so that he can ride on it, fulfill Zechariah 9.9, 9, affirm that he is the Messiah, the King, the Son of David that the people have been waiting for, that the Old Testament prophesied would come. Note also the crowd is spreading their coats on the road. That would have been a, a practice held in the ancient Near East whenever they would welcome a new king to a city. We can look at 2 Kings 9.13 for an example of that. And the crowd actually quotes from Psalm 118.26 to sing, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. That was part of the, the praise music that would be featured at Passover. Notice also how they say peace in heaven and glory in the highest. It's a very nice callback to Luke 2 where we see the angels proclaiming something similar. In that case, it's glory in the highest and peace on earth among those with whom God is pleased. And then finally in chapters 39 through 48, we get Christ's righteous rebukes, three of them as Luke closes this chapter. First, Christ rebukes the Pharisees who were actually wanting Jesus to rebuke his disciples because they're proclaiming him to be the Messiah, here to fulfill scripture. That's blasphemy in the Pharisees' eyes. They do not see Jesus as the Messiah. They're waiting for some strong military captain to rise up, perhaps from even within their ranks. But Jesus turns that around on the Pharisees. He declares that even if every human shut their mouths, the truth will still be declared. Even if God must use aspects of his creation that have no life in them, such as the very stones, the truth will be 
declared. Christ will be proclaimed. Christ then rebukes Jerusalem, sorrowfully declaring how much he cared for the city and people within, but they had not seen and received the truth that he was their Messiah, their King, in fact, God himself. Of course, they've had plenty of of opportunities. They've seen uh, the examples and proof that he is the Messiah, but their spiritual sight was still blind. And the prophecy given here by Jesus was fulfilled in AD 70. That's when Titus of Rome raised the city to the ground. Now note, Jesus had visited Jerusalem before, but at this point, we're just days away from his rejection by the city and his crucifixion outside its gates. So no wonder he is mourning the people at this time. Remember, truly God and truly man, and that's Luke's focus, that he's the son of man. So he has emotions, and he exhibits them here. In fact, God the Father has emotions as well. The Holy Spirit we see is grieved when we sin against him. Well, Christ then finally rebukes the money traders in the outer court of the temple. They had turned the house of God into a robber's den. They were in the practice of selling sacrificial animals and other religious items at high cost to visiting Jews and Gentile God-fearers who wished to partake in the Passover that week. They're taking advantage of them, and the Lord Jesus throws them out from the temple. Well, on the subject of faithfulness, we saw that parable, the minas, the minas. May we remember faithfulness is the only mark of success in the life of any Christian. It's not about uh, numbers. It's, it's not even about how much fruit is born from us as we serve the Lord. That, that's up to him. But God commands us to be faithful to Christ with our lives once we are born again. May that be true of you. And I, 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 5, Paul says, Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. But to me, it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself. I'm conscious of nothing against myself, yet I'm not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord. Paul says he doesn't examine himself according to human means. He uses the word of God. He trusts that the Lord is going to reveal the sin in his life. He will repent from that sin as he continues to grow in Christ-likeness. And that's why he says, Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. May we be faithful in serving the Lord this very day and beyond. This has been Luke 19. I hope you have a great day.